Thank you for joining us. This is Will with Perpetual Assets. Uh, happy to have our friend on the line, Mr. Bix Weir from RoadToRuda.com. It's been a while, Bix. How are you, buddy? I'm doing very well, Will. I'm, I'm happy to be talking about uh, these crazy things we're going through right now. Yeah, the times are, are surreal. Uh, I mean, you know, it's pinch me moment almost, almost every day now. Um, you have a new book out, number three in the series. I do. It, it's it's being receptive. You know, the crowd is all excited about it because not only does it deal with kind of the things that we've been looking at in the first few books, you know, how we got here, Fed secretly doing, and all that, but it also talks about you know what our solutions are for getting out of this mess and moving forward, and you know, what's going to happen to silver and to gold and to Bitcoin and. And some of the bigger chapters talk about, you know, will silver investors ever get justice for the pain and suffering from these criminals after all these years? Uh, things like that. And uh, it's selling great and people love it. And there, you know, a lot of people say, hey, where's the fourth book? And so you know, just when you get the third book out, they're, they're looking for more. So it's great. And I encourage everybody to, to check it out. Uh, you can come to my website. It's the first item up there and just click on it and uh, it'll give you a, kind of a synopsis of what it's all about. Yeah, there are a lot of questions out there uh, right now, rightfully so. I mean, those of us that are, <clears throat> you know, starting to come to grasp with reality, um, you know, it, it can be terrifying. I mean, for, for many of us who, who went through this process five or ten years ago, but for a lot of folks and a lot of clients of mine and a lot of your readers' picks, uh, you know, are, are new to this. I mean, they, you know, and so there's a lot of questions and n nobody has all the answers. Uh, but we try to have these interviews with our with guys like you that have become friends, that are experts in the field, that uh, have their ears to the ground, that talk to a lot of people, a lot of insiders. Um, and you know, Bix, your work for for many many years uh, has been a beam of light, a breath of fresh air in a really dark and scary place. Uh, in fact, I interviewed you probably two years ago, and I remember you know wanting to start a bumper sticker campaign that Bix, uh, pray, pray Bix is right, you know, uh, and, and there have literally been times that I have prayed that you are right in, in much of that, that your, um, that your work in what you've discovered, that, that you believe that there are good elements, that there are good forces behind the scenes, behind the curtain, battling with the bad forces that are clearly, you know, uh, prevalent, um, and uh, anyway, it is, it is, it is, I'll let you, I'll let you touch on the message as we discuss the book, but um, I also would I, like I, to... I would like to say on that topic, I would say it is clear to me and, and to a lot of people I talk to that the good guys have won this battle. Now, that doesn't mean that the bad guys are, are gone and, and there's not control over the system, but they have won this battle and it is clear that... Now it's just positioning the world so that we can be you know, making the transition a little easier from destroying the financial system to moving to something new. A lot of work is being done on that front. But the, the, I would say the battle good versus the good guys versus the bad guys has been won and the good guys are on top right now. They're just getting ready. The first chapter of my book is called The Weight and what they're doing is – Two things, really. One, they're getting ready to transition out of the, the current system, take down the monetary system, and then move to something new. And, and that can be a very chaotic thing. So they want to preserve, you know, make sure that power stays on and that people get vital services and food and water keeps going. That's a lot of what's going on behind the scenes right now. Mm -hmm. But also, they're also blowing the bubbles bigger and bigger and bigger because they want this this time as opposed to 2008. They want this one, this explosion to be 10 times the size. And that's why you see all this you know, sovereign debt that's built up and the derivatives over at Deutsche Bank blowing up. All this stuff is, is meant to be building to a much bigger crash than we saw in 2008 because you need something like that to get rid of all of it and to start fresh. So I'm excited. It's clear that the good guys have won matter when the the final chapter in this book is, is played out. Yeah, well, I'd like to for us to touch on some, some evidence, things that we've seen. I can think of a few. I'm sure you've got hundreds. Uh, things that we've seen, whether it be little laws that are changed or Fed statements or this or that, 
that are evidence of what you just mentioned, uh, that not only that the good guys are on top, but that there are uh, things being done to allow the next collapse to be the big one. You've said for a long time that uh, the good guys, the good element has always been uh, providing the rope for the bankers, for the bad guys to hang themselves. And it, and it seems like that comments you just made and, and some of the evidence that we'll talk about, uh, they are doing just that, and more so every day. I mean, like, like dumping gasoline on a fire uh, when you think about derivatives, when you think about trillions of dollars in backdoor QE, potentially on like a monthly basis. Um, so it's very interesting stuff. Uh, when, 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 <sighs> When folks like Jim Willie, when the message, when this message, when your message uh, is is corroborated by others in the field, namely Jim Willie, the last time I had him on last week, we talked about many of these same things and the white hats and the, the powers in the East, uh, many of them aligned with the powers and the, the, the good powers in the West that are saying enough is enough, uh, enough is enough of the of the poisoning and the pollution and the, you know, peeing in the punch bowl, so to speak. Um so, so what? When I think of evidence of this, one thing that recently just pops into my mind was uh, changing of the banking laws, basically to allow the two bigs to fail, the two big to fails to fail. There's no longer those those uh, you know safeguards in effect to allow them for bailouts anymore. That that is that is the big one, and and it's not only that. You know, everybody the the Fed keeps changing the rules, and everybody thinks every time the Fed changes the rules, it's it, it means the bad guys are winning. One of the rules they changed, um, it was it changed as part of the Dodd Frank rule, was that there the large derivative holders like Bank of America and uh, JP Morgan, they put their derivatives into an entity within their bank that is covered by money, and now they've added trillions, tens of trillions, if not hundreds of trillions of dollars in derivatives to the FDIC bailout, and they put in the law that the, the derivatives get paid out first. Now, the reality is, what's that going to do? It's when the, when the next crash happens, which I believe could be any day, if not, uh, you know, I'm looking for a March, April hiccup, if not the, the full crash, or the full crash by September, but March and April are huge because of the the reporting that has to be done on the the natural gas markets and the write downs the banks are going to take are gigantic, mm -hmm. but having said all that, when the crash happens, they stand up and say no, we are not bailing you out this time, and you, you see all these movies like The Big Short and the 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 Madoff movie you know mini series that came out. All this is coming out right now to get the anger up, get people ready. To, the first thing they have to pay out is derivatives. Will Congress say, okay, we're going to give you, you know, hundreds of trillions in derivative bailouts, and then we're going to, you know, then we're going to bail out the taxpayer because that's what the law says. No, I don't think they're going to do any of it. I think they're going to say no this time. And that is huge because nobody talks about what it means if a too big to fail bank actually fails. And Hank Paulson basically told Congress, you know, if you don't give us $700 billion, this is in you know, 2008, if you don't give us $700 billion by within a half an hour, the entire system will be gone and you will lose everything in the electronic fund side because all the banks hold everybody's money. So they bail them out. That's what happens when a too big bank fails. Mm -hmm. Everything is destroyed. We, uh, <clears throat> apologies, we had a little feedback there. Um, when you were in that last last couple of minutes, um, so it was a little bit patchy. But um, if you could summarize, I mean, basically what you were saying is <clears throat> that the the banks essentially are uh, putting all these derivatives on the side of the books. They're, they're basically allowing all of the they're putting all of the risk uh, on the side on the treasury on the on the nation. Um, exactly, and and. and and it's the it, the key is that they put the derivatives in front of uh, everyday Joe for FDIC insurance. First, so, first position. So the, the derivative yeah. is in first position <clears throat> when the system falls apart. The Congress, the the you know whoever's going to be standing around uh, looking at these numbers are going to say, wait a minute, we owe the we, so we got to come up with <clears throat> whatever forty trillion dollars for, for banking derivatives first uh, before while we rob Joe uh, Smith's uh, retirement account. 
the rules are changed for the banking system for the better and for the worse. One is that, you know, the bailouts are going to be a lot harder to do on the sly by the Fed. The other is that the derivatives were put in front of the people getting bailed out. So FDIC insurance now falls under, for some of the big banks, now falls under um, the, the situation where if the FDIC wants to go to Congress to get money, the first money they're going to get is going to be for bailing out the bank derivatives. That is a huge thing. Because, yes, people will always vote themselves a bailout, but they never want the, the banks to be bailed out. Well, in this situation with the FDIC, the law says they have to bail out the banks first in the hundreds of trillions of dollars in derivatives, and then they can bail out you know, the $250,000 FDIC insurance for individual you know, checking and savings accounts. So it's huge, and it, what it's – what it, why it's being done is because they want to get Congress and, and the people of the United States into a position where they can finally say no to the bailouts. Mm -hmm. And it would be no to the bailouts of the banks, which also means no to the bailouts of the people also. So that in that way, you have the big crash. And, and the people should also be told that, hey, with, when you say no, it means, yeah, your electronic assets are gone. But also your electronic debts are gone, and that is the big problem in the world is, is the electronic debt. So that's, that's kind of the, uh, you know, the break-even scenario when, the, when the, the electronic system crashes with these big banks. A too-big-to-fail bank that crashes, the system cannot withstand that, and they have gotten the, the U.S. into a position reg through regulation that the next one that crashes will be it. And I think it's very exciting. It's very scary, but it's very exciting. Well, <clears throat> the numbers we're talking about are massive. I mean, <clears throat> you know, one bank. What is what is Bank of America's uh, derivative exposure? Isn't it like a hundred trillion dollars or something? No, no, no. Bank of America's. I think it's uh, thirty-five or forty. The oh, big okay. one. Okay. The big one is Deutsche Bank. And you're reading about Deutsche Bank every day in the newspaper now yes. as their stock is plummeting. Yes. And they're at I think seventy-five to eighty-five trillion dollars. And they have huge exposure to the European debt, the, the debt of Portugal and Greece and Italy, and oh, it's, it's just a mess. That's going to be the counterparty failure because at the other end of those transactions are Bank of America US and banks. Wells Fargo. Yeah, U.S. banks. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, even st sticking to U.S. soil here, um, <clears throat> U.S. banks have, I mean, B of A, I mean, we, we've got tens of trillions of dollars, if not just on U.S. soil with all the banks, 100 plus trillion dollars in, in derivative exposure. If we have a, a banking collapse, uh, we have another 2008, 2009. We, we've, they're talking about bailouts again. First of all, the FDIC, I, I came across this statistic years ago, so I'm going to butcher the heck out of it. But I think their, 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 their cash, their money on hand was like in, in the single digit billions. Maybe double digit. It was like 19 billion or something. It was like New York Life, the company New York Life's cash reserve fund was larger at the time. Um, <laughs> it's so, true. Yeah, I mean, it was a very small amount of money. So if we're talking about all these oil hedges expiring and we're talking about this massive, massive, massive multi trillion dollar uh, write down, exposure, hiccup, blow up, um, <clears throat> they're going to have to. What is the argument going to be, Bix? Okay, well, we're going to need to print. A hundred trillion dollars to, to fix everything, and it's going to be fine after that. It's just a hundred trillion dollars. I mean, that, that will be the argument, and that's that's kind of where they're getting people into position. Remember, in two thousand eight, the FDIC ran out of money, and they had to go to Congress, and Congress gave them a line of credit. I think it was six hundred billion dollars, which is extremely radical at the time, but nobody knew what was going on. You know, nobody knew why you had to give the bank seven hundred billion dollars and. And, you know, the first time it went to a vote in Congress, it got denied and the stock market dropped by like a thousand points and everybody was going crazy. And then, you know, then they three days later, they came back and they approved a bill, but they also approved with it the FDIC insurance and uh, what Obama called the bailout for the people of like uh, over a trillion dollars for, you know, road works or something ridiculous like that. Basically, the idea was to. You know, if we're going to bail out the banks, we're going to try to bail out the world with money, and it, it's it's just gotten worse and worse. Yeah, it, it's unbelievable. I mean, um, 
it, you know, I try to rewind <clears throat> where I was at mentally in, in 2008. And I just, I wasn't, I wasn't there yet. I wasn't as dialed in as I am now. So I can't, I mean, watching how it's going to unravel this time and just how massive the numbers are. I mean, we've added zeros, lots of zeros to the end of all of the numbers, all of the problems. Um, I, and that, that was always the plan. The, and I remember in 2009 when the stock market bottomed, it was like that day, everybody came on the news and said, oh yeah, we've hit bottom, we've hit bottom. And I sent out an article saying, oh, it looks like they're going to rig the market higher because you know, the, whole, the whole system is saying the same thing at the same time, and that's what they do when they're trying to rig the market. And I said it might take a long time, and it has. My God, it's taken a long time for this next one to happen. But they've mm-hmm. built it up so big now, mm-hmm. and so many trillions of dollars. You know, Last time, they had to bail out AIG for I think it was $350 billion because uh, they were a counterparty. Now you're looking at Deutsche Bank that needs bailing out, and they're you know eighty five trillion dollars. So Gosh. clearly, there's no entity in the world that could that could create a bailout like that, and you know without doing it you know secretly. And, and the at least the Fed in the U.S. side has uh, closed the secret doors of you know Congress has closed the secret doors of the Fed, so they're going to have to do it. Uh, on the up and up, and, and they're not going to do it. I mean, this is this was the plan of the Fed all along was to blow the system as big and wide and and the monetary system bubble as big as you can to ultimately and then ultimately destroy the system and go back to a gold standard. Mm-hmm. It, it's yeah. Looking at the, I mean, the timing is interesting too. I mean, your your, your premise and your studies and your ideals that hey, there are good guys all within the Fed. Uh, that have been allowing this to happen, given the the bankers more than enough rope to hang themselves. Looking at it, you know the, the timing, like with Yellen, is it's just it's interesting. And then you you you're like, why is Yellen the headpiece right now? It's so odd. So much of what she says and the positioning and what they're doing and and it, and it all must play in, you know. It 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 does, and I mean that's why they put Bernanke where he was because he was playing the same game, blow that bubble as big as possible. Yellen is more of a pawn, and the, the real guy running the show at the Fed is Stanley Fisher, the number two guy, the, the ex-head of the uh, the Israeli Central Bank. Mm-hmm. You know, why this guy is is the head of our monetary system now kind of gives you a hint as to you know what's going on behind the scenes. But that, if you're looking for the the evil head of the Fed right now, it is it's Stanley Fisher. Um, and Yellen is, you know, there's multiple. I've met her before too. There's multiple accounts of her being not the brightest bulb in the uh, in the basket. So uh, I, I hear her talk and I just kind of chuckle because I met her back in like uh, what was it about '98. Uh, she gave a speech and you know, I talked to her afterwards and it was interesting. She was head of the San Francisco uh, Fed at the time, mm-hmm. uh, but she didn't know. You know, I asked a couple questions about you know. China, aren't you scared that China's going to grow and, and, you know, overtake the U.S. And, you know, as far as manufacturing, she says, oh, no, 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 it could never happen. And, of course, we see now that they take all the manufacturing. So, yeah, Yellen has no idea what she's doing. And, and she's, she was put there as a, as a Ponzi, as a, as a patsy, patsy yeah. to, to take the blame and take the hit. I, I always thought that she would at some point step down and uh, Stanley Fisher would automatically take over because he's second in charge. So uh, I don't know if he wants to be in that much of a spotlight because, I mean, that's where the crux of the, mm-hmm. the evil part of the Fed lies is with Stanley Fisher. Yeah, I, I kind of feel sorry for Yellen ever since watching her almost pass out. Uh, oh, I know. Yeah. Can you? I mean, that is – you can't write that stuff in a movie. That was crazy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, she had a clear, like, you know, like breakdown, like stress breakdown, some sort of, you know, crazy overload experience right there. You know? There's a brain cloud. Yeah. My friends are calling it. She had brain clouds from the, <laughs> the movie Joe versus the Volcano. I have a brain cloud. <laughs> That's great. Well, well, talk, tell me more about the book. I mean, what what, what else are you seeing behind the scenes? Uh, you know, I, I know you're you've got some connected sources. You're a connected guy. What's what? You mentioned March, April. We're going to see some major hiccups at least, but it certainly seems like this is the year for fireworks. Uh, and it is. And you know, it, at the end of the book, I put I have a special report I did on the the New Economist magazine, mm-hmm. uh, the World in 2016. 
I'm sure many of your listeners were uh, interested in the the 2015 Economist magazine that had all the uh, the signs and signals of the uh, of the French terrorist attack on the, right on the front with the date and the arrows and the the soccer ball at the soccer stadium and all that. The the 2016 magazine is is chock full of things that I think that the bad guys have planned for us, and I, I do a full article on on what it is. And, and one of the big things for me, you know, I've long talked about all the gold that's hidden in the Grand Canyon. I've, I've interviewed people who have been there. I've done a ton of research. The New York Times announced it in, in a 1910 article. Yeah, the military is there now and you're not allowed to go there. It's a no-go zone within the, within the Grand Canyon. And there it is right in the Economist magazine on the inside cover and the inside calendar this crazy pictures of bombs exploding and arrows going off, and there's these gold tanks moving into uh, mm-hmm. this this uh, cave. Mm-hmm. In the, it's a gate, a gold cave with the a national park sign right above it. No kidding. All symbolic of of the bad guys wanting to go into all the the hidden gold mines we have in in the United States, and there's a lot of them. Um, the Chocolate Mountain. Uh, gold discovery that was that Diane Feinstein brought a whole bunch of senators out there and showed them this gigantic gold mine and you know basically they said hey this is what we have to use as money when people stop using the Federal Reserve note mm-hmm. and we will be prepared I believe the I talk about in the book the uh, US mint is currently minting millions of coins gold and silver not telling anybody, but they're doing it, and they will be ready to stand up and say, okay, we, we do have a way to get out of the current situation, the crash of the banking system. Do you know any idea what they're minting, Bix? I mean, are they minting eagles? Well, I, I think it's eagles, dimes, nickels, quarters, and gold and silver. Yeah. I, I think there's – I think there's – I am – I – convinced there are millions of tons of gold out there not the 170,000 tons and we've we've got multiple uh studies and investigations into the Yamashita's gold that and I've proven time and time again that there's all kinds of gold out there um so but then there's less silver so that it gets to my point where I really became a big silver bug back uh five or six years ago when I discovered all this gold and, and discovered that the the U.S. was hiding all the the, um, the information about this gold, and they were hiding the fact that they had to shut down the largest uh, uh, secret military base just to get a half a billion ounces of silver out of it in the 1990s that was used in the making of the first atom bomb. Really interesting stuff to gold ratio is going to change drastically, more like at, at some point, it'll probably be one to one, and then settle out at four to one. Where right now it's what seventy five to one. Yeah, yeah. Um, we had a little more feedback on that last couple minutes too. Um, yeah, great. Yeah, it, but you were talking. You mentioned Yamashita's gold, and and you were talking. You know, the <clears throat> I think that the Economist magazine covers. I mean, I, I'm going to put those in the the write up that we do on this article. So we'll show the uh, last year, 2015. Where you, you mentioned, and it's funny, you mentioned the, 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 the you know, Paris terror attack, and I remember the 2015 cover, and I remember all those things you mentioned, and now looking back, I remember, of course, the terror attack, and, and there's all those things. Now the 2016 cover, you've been talking about uh, the Grand Canyon and the use of national parks to stash huge gold hoards for a long time, and now now it's on the cover of a freaking Economist magazine or the so inside. It's, it's on the inside. It's the, on the, the inside. The inside fold out. Yeah, I've seen the 2016. I almost bought one in the airport, but I couldn't. I couldn't stand giving the twenty dollars to the Rothschild uh, 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 families. <laughs> yeah. So I'll just use the JPEGs online to look at the pictures. But uh, we'll include those. So God, that's crazy. I, I do. I remember looking, I think at you and Sean interview, uh, where you were covering the, the that bifold or whatever in the center of the magazine, uh, where there are tanks going into a cave, uh, with a national park sign above it. Yeah. Uh, I, if you, if you look, just turn to the back of the book, it's, there's uh, the full article and, and pictures and tells you all about it. Man, so you think gold to silver ratio is going to kiss kiss one to one and then eventually settle out somewhere around four to one? I mean, 
God, that makes me want to go tr trade my gold for silver. The problem is, where do you put the stuff, Bix? <laughs> yeah. Well, if, if that's if, if the biggest problem you have is where to store silver, that's a great problem to have. That's true. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I've, I've been saying this for years that, that it is a no brainer to swap all your gold for silver mantra um, because silver is necessary in life. Mm -hmm. And without silver, you're, you're not going to have your cell phones and your flat screen TVs and your solar power and all that. You know, gold is, is a monetary instrument pretty much only. With silver, it is both. And it used to be prior to, you know, 70 years ago, uh, before electronics, it was the most important form of money we had. Mm -hmm. You know, it was always known as the poor man's, uh, poor man's gold or or uh, if you go back in history, silver is used a lot more as money than gold is. Mm -hmm. And and the only reason it changed is because England and the Rockefellers, I mean the Rothschilds, decided to demonetize silver back in the 1850s with the Opium Wars. And it's been going on ever since. And the whole plan was to take silver out of the monetary system, mainly because they didn't have it. They didn't have the silver. Um, so they, they, you know, the 150 year plan was to demonetize it, which they finally did in the, you know, the, in the 1960s and seventies. And then, uh, right now you're seeing that, that that's going to flip right on its head and people will use silver as money again first. And then as for industrial applications, some of them, whichever, you know, they're going to have to charge a lot more for them. Um, but that will be the second, uh, use of, of silver, uh, going forward after, this monetary system crashes. Can you imagine, Bix, what it's going to be like looking back and saying fifteen dollars silver? Well, <laughs> see, that's the other thing is you know, I mean, what what will silver be monetized as? Well, I mean, if you have a crash in the system, there will be no dollars, the Federal yeah. Reserve note dollars. So the, right. the the dollar, you know, it's not going to be revalued. It's going to be a new treasury. Dollar back to a constitutional U.S. dollar, so there'll be you know yeah there will still be some uh, electronic money around possibly, but mm -hmm. as as the bad guys try to you know revamp their system, but truthfully, you know a, a U.S. coin that says one dollar on it minted by the Treasury is going to be a, worth a whole lot more than a Federal Reserve note dollar that we're playing with today. Well, yeah, I mean, let's look. So you're talking about relative purchasing power. Like, okay, well, yeah. what does yeah. an ounce of silver buy me today in groceries, in gas, in uh, in energy uh, versus, you know, let's, okay, absence of U.S. dollars, which is, which is where we're headed. So we kind of have to have to think that way. So, yeah. you know. I, I think a great way to think of it is, and I talked about this in another interview, was the – Historically, when we were on a gold and silver standard, we used silver as money. A a day's worth of work was worth a silver dime yes. for your average worker. Well, that's all well and good. This was before you know nineteen in the nineteen forties and before. Mm -hmm. Well, if we go back to that standard, will it be the same? I don't think so because back then we had fifty billion ounces of silver. Mm -hmm. All that silver has been consumed in the electronics, and now we have maybe five billion ounces on on the surface of that we've mined. So I would say now a single dime, silver dime will be worth a week's worth of work, not a day's worth of work because there's so little silver out there. Interesting. And that, and a silver dime is like less than a 10th of an ounce, right? Like a 12th of an ounce or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, what 70, 75% silver or something, something like that. Yeah. Point so, yeah. Seven, seven times a dollar. Yeah. Point zero. So, and Chris Duane has, you know, covered this in extreme depth going back even, you know, early, early times, human times in, in history with, with labor. Uh, where men were paid for 12 hours of sweat and busting their everything and, you know, bleed, blood, sweat, and tears were, were paid about a tenth of an ounce. Um, yeah, so you look at it compared to human labor, you look at it maybe compared to U.S. real estate. Uh, let's just say a basket full of groceries, you know, I mean, a basket full of groceries, you know, nice groceries, maybe a bottle of wine, you know, $150. Uh, you know, my wife goes, she can spend $150 at the grocery store. That's ten ounce. It's a ten ounce bar of silver right now. I wonder what it's going to look like. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm thinking one to one it, to put it into relative terms based on today's dollar. 
you know, maybe gold should be five thousand dollars an ounce, and mm-hmm. silver silver should be one should be a one to one ratio at five thousand dollars an ounce today. That's in today's money. Yeah, that's, that's in today's that's, money. That's absurd. <laughs> Isn't that crazy to think about? But but supply and demand, man. You know, once we have free markets in in a in free exchange traded market where people come to exchange their their money for real silver and no more futures options contracts, no more LBMA, no more Mm -hmm. comics. That's when you're going to see the real value of silver come through. Yeah. Yeah. It's again, fundamentals. I mean, when you look at, when you really study the fundamentals, this is mathematical fact. This is like science here. This is like how much, how much does it, is it even in the earth's crust? How, how much of it comes out of the earth's crust? You know, all these, how much of it is used in these different areas of demand? You know, those are all fund market fundamentals that are, that are like laws. Um, I was trying to explain to my wife the other day, market capitalization, market cap. And, and, and we we're talking about market cap of, of Bitcoin versus, you know, physical silver, physical gold, and then all the, you know, going all the way up. I started with, you know, I started on the big side. Okay. Government bonds, you know, the market cap for government bonds is probably, you know, however many trillions of dollars, you know, and then you work it all the way down. What's the market cap of physical silver? You're, you're going to be, have a better grasp on it than I would at this point. Well, if, if, if there is, you know, say let's just, Say five billion ounces above ground uh, at fifteen bucks an ounce. You okay. know, it's you know what uh, what does that come up to? Fifty, seventy-five billion. Seventy-five billion. Yeah. So you know, a, a handful of billionaires get together and they can literally oh, yeah. corner the uh, whole market. But that's every single. That's not investable. Silver. Right. That's right. every single ounce. You know, in your in your uh, your tea set and you know in your earrings. Well, companies like Apple <clears throat> probably use a lot of the stuff. You know? Oh yeah! Oh yeah! How much and cash you, do they have on hand? <laughs> <laughs> well, true. I mean, that's a, a question: is you know where do, where do they keep their cash? You yep. know, in, in what bank, and and will that go away? Of course, it will go away. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's it's we're we're entering into a very scary time, and I think everybody should prepare for some uh, dislocation of of everything they know to be true. Mm-hmm. It's interesting your 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 comment about the weight <clears throat> and that being W A I T I presume uh, being the first chapter of your book uh, in that and Jim Willie I don't need to bring him up again but he he he's this has come up in, in with him as well uh, some of his sources thought that this thing was going to be dropped a, a year or two years ago and and here we are still and it has to do with as you say uh, a delay to allow hopefully for a, a less troublesome transition. Yeah, and, and it, it'll be troublesome. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> you know, some of this stuff, there's going to be people dying. That is just a fact. And that they're trying to, you know, minimize that, but you, you can't get away from it. Yeah. Um, so... Well, think it, of a natural it, disaster. I mean, you know, think of a, of a hurricane or like, you know, a, a large-scale natural disaster that basically hits the whole country. Hell, in this case, the whole world all at once. Yep. Yeah. And this will be a you know, hundred times worse than that. So yeah. prepare accordingly, mm-hmm. and 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 get your money out of your your IRA and your four hundred one k. I've been screaming about that for years. You know, if you if you don't want to take the tax hit, call Will, <laughs> call Will, and and get your your uh, investment money into physical silver in your own possession because the time is running out you're not mm-hmm. going to have time and you're, you're watching the stock market drop and you you know it's going to happen you need to do it now yeah it's you know <clears throat> you've been a big advocate of, of of what we do and of course we've been a big advocate of yours but you know it's it's time is running out i mean it's um you know i hope we can reach people as fast as possible here in these final you know these final days and hours cuz it's uh it is it's 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 getting it's getting real fast Yep. Yep. Well, my friend, I uh, I always love having you on. I'm sorry if we had a little bit of hiccups uh, in the, in the audio there, but we'll get it cleaned up. Is there anything else you want to uh, to add about the book? I'm excited to read it. Um, I know, just yeah, you know, most of the stuff is in the book that I, that I talk about. And, you know, there's some uh, things about the hidden technologies that are going to be released after we get rid of all these bad guys, which is really exciting. Um, because you know we've been kind of kept in the dark for a lot of things over a hundred years, and, and th- there's some great technologies for power and for transportation that that are about to come out, and uh, it truly can change the world. All we got to do is get rid of these bad guys. You know, that's very very interesting, uh, and yet another subject that 
is now correlating across different different avenues. You, Jim Willies of the world, and again, I, those of you guys that that I respect, uh, that are out there, that are well connected, that have been for decades in this field and in this space. Um, when, when the messages start to overlap, then it's re- yeah, and that's what's happening here, you know. Um, so yeah, new technology is being released. Uh, Jim was telling me the Rockefellers, uh, and a lot of these, you know, elitist entities divested of all of their oil and, and, and fossil fuel holdings like their Chevrons and the, you know, everything else about, you know, six and 12 and 18 months ago, good timing right before oil has, has collapsed. And hence all those companies now looking at, you know, near bankruptcy, um, New technologies, free energy technologies. Certainly, certainly there's cost in the infrastructure, but uh, these, you know, Tesla. I think about you know Nikola Tesla. These 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 uh, technologies have been around uh, for a long, long time, and the and yeah, the, the yeah. lid has been kept pretty tight on them for insane, insane profits. And now is the time. You know, I, I have a chapter in the book, the time of revelation, which is not a religious uh, kind of. Uh, play there it, it is a time to reveal all these secrets that we have been holding back so uh yeah get the book and uh let me email me and let me know what you think and if you have any questions so uh it's exciting well it is man you know you, you, you've we've talked about front row seats and uh it's certainly you know it's certainly unfolding and, and we really appreciate your work man very very much and uh Excited to read the book. We'll have links uh, so you guys can can check out Bix's work, uh, his private road, which is a very reasonable subscription, and he, and he shovels out a lot of really good detailed information every Friday on that, and probably even more than that. Um, so anyway, thanks again, my friend. Uh, let, let's do it again in another you know couple months. Sounds good. Well, all right, Bix, take care, bud.